Father, as we continue in worship, um, we're so thankful that uh, we can stand on the foundation of Christ and we look forward to his return. In his name we pray, amen. So how long will this thing last? Will my loved ones be safe? What do I do if I've lost my job? Will I lose my job? Will we find a cure or a vaccine and will we outlast it? A lot of questions are swirling through our minds, I suppose, at this time. And today as I look at our text, I see that we're not the only ones asking questions. In fact, there was someone way back when who had a lot of other questions as well. He was searching. His country was searching. They were under oppressors and they were looking for a leader to deliver them. And he thinks he knows someone who might be able to help. He's taking a bit of a risk approaching this person because if he's found out, he'll either be ostracized by his friends or attacked by the government. And so he decides to approach at night. And like many things, and I'm sure you've experienced this as well, the conversation goes quite a bit different than what he had intended. Before long, it's all tangled up, and he's simply left with this question, how can these things be? What in the world is going on? And the answer given to him by the rabbi, the teacher, the prophet, whoever you think it might be, was actually to ask him a question. And the question was, do you remember the time when our entire country was sick? I'm talking about John chapter 3 when Jesus and Nicodemus are having their late night conversation. Nicodemus, a uh, Jewish leader, and Jesus, the new guy on the block, this rabbi. And it refers to this plague that happened in Numbers chapter 21 when the children of Israel were leaving Egypt and moving into the promised land. It's a little bit probably grainy or fuzzy in your memory like mine. And so just to refresh, what had happened is they were stuck in Egypt. God delivers them. They cross the Red Sea. They go through all this stuff. They get the Ten Commandments. They get manna and quail. And they're moving and they're about to go into the promised land. And frankly, they just get sick of it. They've been there for 40 years and... Aaron has died, and Moses is ending the near end of his ministry, and boy, they're, they've had enough. Talk about social isolation. They've been in the desert. And so they begin to complain. Numbers chapter 21, beginning in verse 4, says this. Here's the story of what happened then. It says, And the people of Israel set out from Mount Hor, taking the road to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people grew impatient with the long journey. And they began to speak against God and Moses, saying, Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die here in the wilderness? They complained. There's nothing to eat here, nothing to drink, and we have this horrible manna. So the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people, and many were bitten and died. Imagine at that time they were asking questions too. Will my loved ones be safe? Will we find a cure? How long will this thing last? Will we outlast it? The people came to Moses and cried out, We've sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take away the snakes. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord told Moses, make a replica of a poisonous snake, and of all things, attach it to a pole. And all who are bitten will live, simply, if they look at it. So Moses made the snake out of bronze and attached it to a pole. Then anyone who's bitten by a snake could look at the bronze snake and be healed. John 3.14 says this. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so too must the Son of Man be lifted up. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. During times like today, I think it's very important that we come back to the things we know for sure. Certainly there are a lot of questions. But what do we know and what can we say for certain? And I think there are three things that we know <clears throat> that we frequently say here at Midland Free and now you can say it wherever you're tuning in. And that's this, is that number one, God is good. Number two, God is in control. Number three, Jesus wins. God is good, God is in control, and Jesus wins. How does that happen, Pastor Jeremy? Well, don't ask me. Let's ask the Lord and see what his word has to say. I think John chapter 3, verses 14 through 18 answers that question. As you saw just a minute ago, it says this in verse 14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so too must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him. See then the outcome of the situation which is really only two possible options. Number one, Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Why must Jesus be lifted up? Verse 14 started out by telling us, He must, so too the Son of Man, just like that serpent in the wilderness, must be lifted up. I want to give you three reasons for the absolute necessity of Jesus' exaltation or His lifting up this morning. And the way I'm going to do it, as you can see, I'm sitting down, I've got the Bible verses right in front of me, is basically I'm just going to walk us through John uh, 3, 14 through 18. And so the easiest way for you to pay attention to this, if you're at home or in your car or wherever, is just to open your Bible to John chapter 3. If it's like a lot of Bibles, the letters are probably in red. And I'm going to grab some very important words and pull them out of the text and hopefully show them to you in ways that you have never seen them before. And at the end of the day, you will have three very solid reasons for believing that God is good and God is in control and Jesus wins. So let's start with the first then. Why must Jesus, why must he be lifted up? The answer to that is for the forgiveness of sins. In this text, in the Old Testament, what had happened is the people had rebelled by complaining against God. And so God sent snakes. And so the snakes bit them and punished them. And the people cried out to God. And then they looked up to this symbol of salvation and they received healing. What's happening now in John chapter 3 is that Jesus is saying is that event, that historical thing that happened is foreshadowing or hinting at what will come in the future. In the future, it won't be an isolated incident that is resolved through through a single snake. But instead, what will happen is in a similar fashion, God will solve all of humanity's problems. That in one fatal swoop, the sins of the world have the opportunity to be forgiven. The lifting up this time, of course, is not the snake on a pole, but is instead Jesus on a cross. But if you use your imagination and you think about what a snake would have to look like wrapped around a pole, perhaps with with a cross beam to support it or something like that, you can see how immediately that is beginning to point to Jesus. In the Old Testament, people sin by complaining. But in the New Testament, what's happening is God is saying that it's not just a single sin, but all the sins of all time that can be forgiven. Let me show you what I mean. Verse 16 of John chapter 3 says this. It says that God so loved the world that he gave 
his only son. The first word that I want to jump off the page there is the word God. A lot of us have in mind this vindictive, evil, cruel, judgmental figure who sits on high and has fun making us miserable. If all we read was the snake piece, that's probably what we would see. But what we don't see is that, in fact, the whole thing starts and ends with God. That before the snakes, before the people, before the wilderness, before Egypt, there was God. And God created the heavens and the earth, and He cares about His creation. In fact, so much so that it says He loves the world. The world here is cosmos. It refers not only to people, but all of eternity. Everything that God made, He loves. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and it was good. It was just right. It was the way things were supposed to be. It's the way we want it to be. It's what we look forward to and hope for, but never seem to experience right here and now. God loved that world. He loved it a lot. And as a result, the text tells us he gave his only son. Notice that this love is not a love that is erotic or romantic or self-interest driven. But instead, the type of love that's described here is a giving love, a sacrificial love. It's one that sees someone else who is hurting and acts on their behalf. It's very different than what you and I experience on a daily basis and rarely do we do, but here is the ultimate picture of that thing where there is this perfect creation, somebody else messes it up and because God loves it out of his own good will, he gives the most valuable thing he has, his son, to save it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Now, for those of us who have uh, memorized this text or this verse, John 3.16, a long time ago, we probably learned the word only begotten. And the reason for that is that in the original language, it is monogeneo. The Greek word monogeneo, mono, is only, geneo is to become. And so they translated that word very literally, the only become, the only begotten, the only begotten Son of God. And so for people who take that like that, what happens is sometimes it can lead them down the wrong path to think that Jesus was in some way begotten or made or created by God the Father. But when the scholars look at this word more closely, they realize that the literal translation isn't necessarily the best one. Instead, this is meaning only or unique in the most exclusive way or ultimate sense, that it is not that Jesus was created or ever began, but it is that if ever there was anything that was absolutely 100% unique, it was Him. That God the Father and God the Son and God the Spirit always existed is the undeniable biblical truth and foundational formula of Christianity. But at some point in time, God the Son not only responds as deity, but adds to his deity perfect humanity. And at that point, he becomes Jesus the Christ. But Jesus the Christ is the one who is sent by God the Father. Notice again that this whole thing starts with God the Father. A lot of us start our salvation story with Jesus loves you. But actually, John 3.16 starts with God. God the Father sent the Son. Jesus was following the Father's orders. And as you watch his life throughout all of Scripture, what you see is Jesus is saying, not my will but yours. Lord, Father, God, direct me. Tell me what to do. It's all about you. The whole thing, creation, fall, redemption, restoration, starts and ends with God. For God so loved the world that God made the world And when we broke it, he gave his only son for the salvation of our sins. So the first point that I want to make this morning with regard to this text, with regard to why Jesus must be lifted up, is because there's simply no other way for us to be forgiven. There is only one who has ever come down from heaven, and that is Christ. There is no other means. The Bible is extremely, extremely clear that Jesus, God's Son, is the only way of salvation. 
So the first way in which we see that this text tells us that Jesus must be lifted up is for forgiveness. Number one, Jesus must be lifted up for forgiveness. Now notice that that lifting up was on the cross. In just a moment, I'll show you two other lifting ups. Jesus was actually lifted up three ways, three different times for different things. But the first is for forgiveness. Jesus was lifted up for forgiveness. So <clears throat> let me just be really clear. If you're sitting there this morning, maybe you're a Christian, you're like, okay, I got that. But here's what I want you to do. If your friend or your neighbor or your son or daughter or so-and-so doesn't get that, here's how we can explain it to them. And if this is the first time you're ever hearing this, this is what we mean. I know you've probably heard Christians say things like, you need to be born again, or you need to be believing in Jesus. And people are like, what in the world does that mean? Here's what it means. How might we be delivered and cleansed from the consequences of our sins. Look at this definition. I worked really hard to try to explain this. Here it is. Here's how. The way in which we do that is to accept. Sometimes Christians say believe, and and that's a little bit nebulous, but we do mean believe, but we want you to own for yourself or accept or believe in the God-man. I said the God-man because Jesus is fully God and fully man, and that's essential to our salvation, in his work as the exchange transaction that purchases and secures your salvation. Fleshing that out a little bit more, Jesus' work is his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And the exchange transaction is just like what you do every day at a grocery store or wherever else you go. You see something that you want, In order to get it, you have to pay for it. Once you pay for it, an exchange occurs. You give money, you receive something in return. That's the way the Bible describes salvation. The salvation is God's free gift to us, but it is not free. It cost Him. And it's He who pays for our gift that we receive from Him. So Jesus pays for our sin with His blood. He uses that as the monetary payment that creates the transaction that allows God to exchange our sin for His righteousness. And once Jesus pays that, then we receive the gift of forgiveness of sins. And so when we say, as Christians, we say believe in Jesus, what we mean is to accept, we'll show you that slide one more time, to accept and believe in the God-man's work as the exchange transaction that purchases and secures your salvation. So number one, Jesus was lifted up on the cross. Number one, Jesus was lifted up on the cross. But number two, Jesus was lifted up in the resurrection. Jesus was lifted up in the resurrection. Now, why is that important? Well, a lot of us, when we emphasize salvation, we start to talk about the cross. And so we say, okay, Jesus died on the cross for forgiveness of your sins. That's great. But, If Jesus only goes to the cross and only goes to the grave, then it didn't work. It fell short. Then Jesus was a fake. But what happened is God the Father raised him from the dead to vindicate and prove that this was indeed his only unique son. And by raising him up, he gives Jesus eternal resurrected life. And when we associate with Christ, we also can be raised up and receive eternal life as well. The second raising that happens in this passage is the resurrection. And we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and what we see is that the resurrection is not just for today, but it's for our future. So what we have experienced in Christ and His raising, the first thing, number one, is His raising on the cross for the forgiveness of sins, and number two, His raising from the dead in His resurrection for our future. Some people jokingly say, you know, there's only two things you can count on in life. One is de- death, and the, one is taxes, and the other death. And in a way, that's true. As we sit at home or wherever we're at, and we're afraid of the coronavirus because we think it might kill us or this or that, the reality is we know whether it's corona or something else, at some point in time, we will die. Everyone will die. That's our reality. That's our world. But because of Jesus' resurrection... That guarantees we have hope for the future because Christ was the first fruits or the example. What he was, we too shall be. And just as Christ was raised, so too those 
who believe in him. So number one, Jesus was raised for our forgiveness. Number two, Jesus was raised for our future. And number three, Jesus was raised for our entire world. Earlier I tried to land pretty hard on the fact that God so loved the world. As Christians, sometimes this is hard for us to figure out because um, some people experience God's grace in very particular ways. And others are less familiar with God's grace. And so we wonder, does God love the whole world? And if so, in what sense? Because in verse 18, it's clear that not everybody is saved. And yet, verse 16 says that God loved the whole world. So how does that work? The Bible doesn't exactly explain to us the mysteries of God's infinite knowledge and His perfect work. But what he does tell us in his unlimited eternal mind that he does love the entire world. And so believing in faith that that is true, we accept it and we look forward to his future redemption. And we don't understand necessarily the intricacies of why one person accepts God's gift and another person doesn't. But what it assures us is that his universal love for the world Everything he does is good, and he is in control all the time, even when stuff around us seems really bad. And at the end of the day, because of his love for the world, he will not let his project be destroyed. He will not let this thing go unfinished, but instead, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it, that God, in fact, will redeem the world. So this for me, and I think this for us, is really our assurance this morning as we ask questions, as we look around us, as we see things that are different, that we don't necessarily understand. We ask the question, what do we know? And I think the answer is this, that God is good, God is in control, and Jesus wins. And how do we know that? Because Jesus was lifted up. Jesus was lifted up on the cross. Jesus was lifted up in the resurrection, and Jesus was lifted up in the ascension. In the cross, he was lifted up for the forgiveness of our sins. In the resurrection, he was lifted up for our future hope. And in the ascension, where he was raised to rule eternally with God God at the right hand of the Father, he has been raised for the future of the world. That God has not given up on his creation, but he will return. He will reign over it. He will fix it and make it right. And all that is broken will be made whole. This week, as you go through a number of challenges, I'd encourage you just to remember those three things. That Jesus, God is good, God is in control, and Jesus wins. How do we know that? John 3.16 tells us, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Father, we thank you and praise you, Lord, for lifting Jesus up. And we know that it is our job to lift him up as well. In times like these, we begin to only think of ourselves and what's important and how will this work. But in reality, we know that No matter what the circumstance, the very best thing that can happen is that Jesus is lifted up. Lifted up on the cross, lifted up from the grave, lifted up into the sky to reign forever and more. Lord, we pray that Jesus will be lifted up. In his holy and wonderful name we pray. Amen.